Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Wrestling Diaries podcast show for the average Joe. I'm your host, Mitchell Rulane. Check us out on Spotify and Apple Podcasts and all the other platforms that host podcasts. We release content at least once a week on Wednesdays and sometimes on Fridays or Saturdays. So if also, if you want to see the video, go to YouTube, subscribe, like, comment, share, hit the notification, and it will let you know when our video content comes out. I have a really awesome guest on today, a friend that I've been wanting to try to get on the show forever, ever, ever, ever. The very violent, temperamental, psychotic Matthew Holder. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Just throw it all out there. What's up, brother? Uh, nothing. Just trying to make a living. So to give people a little uh, discography on Matthew Holder here, he is somebody I used to work with. I met you at Sam's Club. Represent Sam's Walmart. Woohoo. Nine, I think in nine years total, I worked for that company. So, to tell people a little bit about you, besides you being an old time friend of mine, you are a, a private investigator. Yeah, newly, not, you know, okay. as and of the, July. And then also a martial arts instructor, Krav Maga specifically. And then your father and a husband of a bunch of, bunch of kids and all that stuff living here in Hoover. So, Tell us a little bit about that. <laughs> well, it's it's definitely a grind, but it's worth it. Um, I think the, uh, well, being married, it's interesting to me. That's when things started taking on like new meaning. Like when I was just working to keep myself up, keep an apartment up, whatever. Um, I didn't really find any kind of enjoyment like in the work and the day-to-day -day stuff, the maintenance. Um, but when you have a wife and you're doing stuff for you guys, it's a family, um, and you're making, help making a place habitable and provide something for somebody else for, for you both, then, um, you know, it takes on new significance. And then when I had the kids, it really took on even more significance. Cause like, for instance, I mean, this may sound corny, but so for instance, uh, I don't like mowing the lawn. I don't like doing like that. So, but I remember, you know, having a family when we had our own house, we had kids, you know, I'm thinking I got to tame this land because my kids need a spot on this earth and they need a place to play a safe place. And, you know, they need to be free from, you know, uh, excessive bug bites and, you know, ant bites and stuff like that. Sure. Need to keep the, uh, coyotes and bobcats down to a minimum but yeah i mean but seriously it feels like that i felt like you know this is our spot on the earth um you know i'm a human being i obviously exist i have a family now uh, my family needs a spot um this is a spot god's given us it's the one thing that we own you know completely ours and nobody else has a right to it um you know we dictate the terms there. And so it really felt like that. I got to, I got to maintain, I got to tame this land. I got to take care of things, you know, for my kids. And so I kind of felt like this, you know, this is a bit of a stretch. Um, and I'm not, I'm not saying that I'm trying to compare myself to the ruggedness of a pioneer settler, but I felt a little bit like that. You know, that's our spot. I'm carving a niche, you know, that's our place, and it's my job to make sure it's secure, make sure it's habitable, safe, um, you know, and a spot where my kids can grow and thrive and develop to their full potential. So, like, now the mundane stuff, like, and I used to, you know, when you're young, you're idealistic and all that, and you think, hey, I'll write a poem, or I'll do something else big, I'll write this piece, I'll speak here, I'll do, you think you got to do something like, grand for it to have meaning or significance and so i just you know i felt kind of like and i really wasn't doing much with my life but i think god was doing a lot in terms of like uh molding me at the time but um i'm a slow learner um but you know it it really you know i get to that point and in these the little things it's a day to day that i realize have all the meaning like, that's what had the significance. Now I feel significance. I feel no need to do anything. I feel no need to argue with people, to make my points, to justify myself. 
Isn't that just a part of getting older, though, too? Like, you kind of, you give less shits about things. Like you're just kind of like, ah, oh, forever. If you get more comfortable in your own skin. Because the thing is, like, look at all these, look at Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. I mean, anybody like that, you've got older people, or you've got these uh, older ladies in their 60s that are trying to uh, make names for themselves. But, the, you know, you've got all these people that still feel like they need to do all this stuff. But um, I'm good, you know. I used to feel like I had to keep up, like I had to argue and the point had to be made and all that. If, um, you know, even with people that they don't really care what you're really trying to say. They just want to um, argue and put down your point of view and justify theirs. Well, a lot of people live in like echo chambers, right? So they only hear what they want to hear and it bounces off. Yeah. But, yeah, I mean, but I had a guy one time and he was, oh, so... You're saying this, you're doing this. And he wouldn't even let me finish. So I said, look, you know, you're being an ass. And I said, if that's the way it's going to go, I said, I'm done. You know, bye. You know, but I say, I say that to Matt all the time. He just keeps on pulling me back. It's weird. <laughs> but, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, you know, you get older, <clears throat> but honestly, I don't, I don't think I would, I don't think I would have come to this point. Like if, if it weren't for Evelyn. Evelyn's his wife. And everybody the, yeah, my wife. Um, if it weren't for her, because she just accepts me no matter what. And, you know, I'm far from being, you know, the perfect. I got to say, I got to say, no insult to you, obviously. It, Evelyn's a very strong lady because you're a very intense personality. You really yeah, are. I get that and lot. so she's, <laughs> I get that a lot. Yeah, but she's, I feel like she's a really strong, I've never had a chance to really get enough time to get to know Evelyn, but I just, I can tell that she's, she seems like a pretty strong woman. She's, uh, she's putting up with you. <laughs> yeah. And all the kiddos and. Yeah. I mean, stuff. dude, I mean, right now, because of my two jobs and the craziness of the schedule, I mean, she's doing so much solo. Like I can't, you know, and excuse me. Now granted, you know, I'm not doing it a lot, but sometimes when I'm alone with kids for two or three hours, you know, I'm like reaching. Your patience. My is, yeah. Well, yeah, and I'm like, man, I need some relief. I, this, is, <laughs> this is hard. You know, it's too difficult, you know, keeping up with all that stuff. But she does it, meals and everything else. And, um, but, you know, this is a, uh, you know, obviously, this is a setup that we chose. It's not like I'm just going around doing my thing and, you know, um, you know, you woman, you're going <laughs> to handle. <laughs> like a kid. You woman, you yeah. do this. Be yeah, man. I'm a man. I don't do dishes. You know, it's not like it's not like That's anything like man. that. It's just you know, and especially in my situation now, um, you know, I've got to make my own living. Like I can't. I don't I have to earn my own work, uh, yeah, and I have, I have to. I have to go get it. You know, it doesn't come to me. Like you know, you work for a company like Sam's, or when I work for Disability, you know, Disability the cases twelve cases a week. It all comes to you. You know. You get your paycheck every couple of weeks, no matter, you know, how hard you work. Um, but this job, you know, if you don't, if I don't work hard, then we're not paying the bills. We're not eating. So I got to go out. And especially because I'm, you know, newer at the job in a few months, I got to really, you know, kind of go after it. So, yeah. So on, on the, uh, the private investigator thing, it, it's basically, I don't know, is freelance the right word? Like you're basically just an independent person doing these cases and then whoever is paying you for uh, jobs done and, and papers served and different things like that. I don't really know a, a ton about PI stuff. So Yeah, so, I mean, some people do. They have PI firms and they, they do have PIs that go in and they start. Um, but you're, you're independent. You're not part of a firm, correct? Yeah, I mean, from prior experiences, I wanted no part of that. Um, well, yeah, you work for yourself. So. Yeah, I want to, yeah, I want to be my own boss to an extent. Now I'm not, you know, you work for someone else, you're not your own boss. So, um, so mostly, um, new people and most of what I'm doing is subcontracting for other PIs. So PIs get work and their overflow, you know, or whatever, then they'll hire other PIs to do that. And so most of my work comes that way. And, but I've, you know, I've gotten a few clients, like I knew a guy, I knew a lawyer. And, um, and so he was willing to give me some process serves. And then that turned into, um, you know, a couple of, t uh, things for locating people. 
Something I was curious about is um, from what I know about what you've told me, you've, you've mostly worked for um, doing jobs for law firms or attorneys and stuff. Have you done any jobs for personal, like private people, like personal citizens, I guess? Can I ask that? Yes. Yes, I have through other PIs and maybe one, you know, one direct client. But yeah, I have, I have done that, like some domestic um, kind of stuff. Being um, a PI is basically kind of like, like a detective, like a, a person, a private detective, right? Yeah, it's essentially. Exa- well, that's exactly yeah. what it is. Yeah. And there are pros and cons, you know, um, you know, and so you, you can't command the force that a law enforcement officer does, but, um, on the flip side, you cannot defend yourself in ways that law enforcement officers can't, you know, they like, have the restriction. You well, you know how they have to, uh, you have to try to control people they can't just haul off and hit someone whatever if i feel threatened i'm a private citizen i can i can handle my business like any private citizen wow that's awesome so yeah i mean in that case but but i also don't have the backup (laughs) oh that's true that's true yeah um a bunch of people start ganging up on you man yeah i mean so you know you have the rights of a private citizen along with some you know additional rights um that come with a license yeah well i mean you're just a regular Citizen, basically, just doing like investigating people and serving them and all that stuff. Do, let, let me ask this: What uh, do you not what, but do you get scared doing the job? Does it make you nervous? Sometimes, you usually it's the build up, and then when you're doing it, a lot of times the nerves, you know, they go away. Um, but a lot of times it's the uh, it's the anticipation, but. Sometimes I find myself when I actually get into the thing, like I'm not. Does that excite you though? The nerves too? Do some of the adrenaline kind of excite you? Because I'm, I'm kind of like that a little bit. Like things that make me nervous and scared also excite me in this weird, twisted way. Like I'm kind of like excited. Other people are completely, they clam up. But me, I'm, I'm nervous, but I'm also kind of like, oh, this is, this adrenaline. It's weird. Like it almost gets you high or something, right? Yeah. I mean, th- there's some of that. Um, I definitely, you know, I like the challenge. Um, I like the challenge of the work. I think it also, you know, presents um, a lot of opportunity for personal growth and strength and things like that. Um, but yeah, it's, it's exciting. Um, and some of the, some of the nerves may come from that, you know, anticipation, stuff like that. You know, the other thing is like wanting to do a good job and being new, um, newer at it. So, um, you know, and obviously there's a learning curve with, um, uh, as with everything else. So, you know, some of that comes, the, the more, the more I know, the more capable I become, the less nervous I am. And a lot of times it's, you know, in those cases, I'm like, sometimes a buildup, you know, I'm nervous. And, and some days it's just my disposition. Like some days I'm not worried about anything at all. Like no matter how risky the situation and other times, like I'll be facing something um, more minor and I'll be nervous. And I'm like, cause I would assume that a lot of it is circumstantial, obviously like more sketchy situations would make you more nervous and less sketchy would be more happy go lucky. But that's interesting. So it has to be like a quote, righteous anger. But like, if I get mad, like if there's a situation and the thing's important and somebody else's well being's at stake, stuff like that. Like if, if I'm focused on that, then a lot of times the nerves will go away. And I, that, that might be some of the reason for me not feeling as nervous in, you know, more difficult, riskier situations sometimes. Um, but yeah, if I'm, and also I think for me personally, it's like, I get nervous when I think about like, about the job I'm going to do and I become perfectionistic. That's, that's the other thing with me. Of course, you know, I've, says of course so yeah 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 so that, and that yeah that makes a lot of sense like you want to you want to just do the job like very perfectly it's not even necessarily the environment that messes with you but it's like oh i want to do like the best job i can yeah and right and when you don't the thing is like when you're learning something you're not you haven't honed everything and so that creates for me personally that creates anxiety like yeah. trial yeah. by fire man yeah So, um, but you know, I'm a lot calmer than I used to be. I used that stuff used to undo me, but you know, now I take into account that there's a, 
you know, I know there's a learning curve, you know, um, and I'm not expecting, you know, I fall into it a little here and there, but I can talk myself out of it. I'm not expecting perfection, um, you know, with everything. I'm working towards it, but, you know, I have more of the perspective of it's something that you gain by, you know, practice and experience, not something that's innate. Now, I know that obviously private investigation stuff can be a little, it can be dangerous, definitely, depending on uh, environments and, and people that you're having to deal with. Obviously, I know that you can't talk about specific things because of your job. But did, when you first were going to get into it, was uh, your wife, Evelyn, was she kind of like, oh, are you sure about this? Was she nervous just knowing that, you know, the the kind of the... I know it's not that dangerous. Obviously, probably being a cop would be more dangerous than being in the military or something. But obviously, there's a there's a sense of danger there. So did, was that kind of a thing for her? Or was she just super cool with it? Or If there was anything, she didn't say anything. But she, and I'll tell her, like, I'll say, pray for me. I've got to deal with this type of person or I got to go do this. So, you know. Yeah. Well, the re the reason I was asking is because I, I was talking to somebody not too long ago about you because um, they were they had some issues. I was like, oh, well, I was like, if you need a PI, I know one, a really good friend that's one. And they're like, oh, you've got a good friend that's a PI? That's dangerous. Do you worry about his safety? And I was like, no. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I mean here's, not really, but. Yeah, but here's the thing. Somebody's got to do it. And what about the, what about the people who's well-being lives you know are at stake you know so i'm just gonna hide out and not do something you know and let these you know when i could contribute and let these people you know languish and suffer let these kids live in bad homes you know um let a spouse be abused you know cheated on whatever i mean because if you don't get evidence of certain things then you know, justice isn't served because, you know, and they don't, maybe a, maybe a parent gets some sort of rights to, you know, to a kid that they maybe shouldn't have because they don't, you don't, don't know the dirt. You don't know the stuff going on. You don't have evidence to prove it. Um, you know, sometimes people, you know, you're doing cases with, you know, sex trafficking rings, you know, whatever, stuff like that. So the thing is like, somebody's got to do it. And if you don't do it, somebody else is going to suffer. And it's easy for me to sit there and worry about my yeah, safety. You know, I, I get it. Like when she told me that, I was like, no, it's a job. And it's, I mean, yeah, there's, I mean, there's danger in everything you do. Like you go into the grocery store, you get hit by a bus or somebody could mug you and kill you. I mean, we remember under oath. Yeah. The, the band. band. Yeah. Oh yeah. Absolutely. Remember that, that song, it's dangerous business walking out your front door mm -hmm. or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, but that, yeah. you know, I think about that life is, it's dangerous. You know, you, you can get, the other thing is living, not doing things because of fear is wrong. I agree. Because you're not doing the right thing, or if you feel like that you have the ability to contribute in some kind of way, and you decide not to use your abilities to help other people because, or to do certain things because, oh, it might be dangerous to me, or I want to be comfortable. Well, you're, you're not doing the right thing because you're afraid. How does that make you a good person? Yeah, I, I had somebody on the podcast um, more recently. I don't remember the specific guest, but we were talking similar to what we're talking about now. And, and I, I try to tell people that, that one big problem I see with people nowadays is they're just, they're too comfortable. And comfort, there's nothing wrong with comfort. I like being comfortable just like the next person. I'm sure you do. I'm sure Matt does and everybody else. But like comfort can also be a coffin. It's a coffocus. Like it's, 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 it's good to get out there and challenge yourself and push yourself because fear is like so many people don't do what they need to do and do what's right. And I don't mean just specifically about what you're doing in danger, but just in, in simple things in life because they're too scared to make the commitment to do what is right. You know what I mean? So they don't do something. They don't act. And then things end up being so much worse in the end. Well, I got to live with, I also have to live with myself, but you know, I believe in God. And I have this constant, um, you know, I have this constant, you know, burden, this pressure. Like if I don't, I know when I'm out of sync with God's spirit and when I'm not doing, when I'm not walking in line with that and I'm not comfortable, I can't live with myself. 
Um, and you know, I'm not saying I'm not going to fail. I'm not building myself up and, you know, saying I'm Mr. Strong and watch me cause I'm nothing is going to stop me. But what I'm saying is like in the end, um, better for me to die than not be able to live with myself. Cause I mean, you're dead already. Right. I mean, you can't live with yourself. There's no point in existing. Like it's just torment all the time. If you don't practice being a man and, and being brave and courageous, and that just doesn't just go for men, but, you know, I think men feel the sense of that, you know, more, um, the need for that. But if you don't, if you don't live that way, if you don't practice that way, how are you going to perform in the moment? Um, and you know, Jesus said that, he said, if you're not, person's not faithful with little, how is he going to be entrusted with much? If you, if you can't do, if you can't face your fears in the day to day, and you know, you got people like Jocko Willink and David Goggins, ex Navy, former Navy SEALs, and they're talk, they talk about, you know, do stuff that sucks every day, do stuff you hate every day, face it, you know, do it. Um, but you know, the other thing goes to this. Um, so what is, what is comfort? Because I had a lot of external comfort, but I had a lot of internal turmoil. Um, and, but I've had a lot of external discomfort and felt at peace. So where does the real comfort come from? From having the circumstances, the perfect circumstances that don't allow you to have fears? Because the fears are there regardless. You just don't have external factors bringing them out. So, or does it come from training yourself and growing so that you can face more and more difficult challenges, the things that life brings. Cause you know, I go, I'm first, I'm, um, let's just say before you're married, you're single. It's not such a big deal. It's a little scary cause you're doing it alone. You know, having a companion is good. You get married though. It's more responsibility. You can't just look after number one anymore unless you want to get divorced very quickly. Um, and then if you have kids exponentially increases with each child. And things are more difficult. And, you know, you have to go through, you have a baby, you have to go through sleepless night and trying to maintain everything else while you're not getting sleep. And, but it's interesting. I think taking on responsibility and doing those stuff, the more you do and the more you take on, I think the stronger you get and the more you're able to, you know, shoulder. And so I feel like I have more energy at, and fortitude at 42 than I ever have, even though. I have far more responsibility than I've ever had. But I felt I felt more lethargic. You know, but I think purpose, I think like purpose and meaning and having something to live for, um, you know, gives you that. Yeah, it's energy. a driving drives. Force. Right. Yeah. yeah it, make, it makes you drive, yeah. Sure. So yeah, man. that's very well said, dude. Very, very well said. Um moving on uh to um you going on to the uh your your pi and stuff like that part of the reason why you got into pi is also because of your other profession which is doing martial arts krav maga specifically so i want to talk a little bit about that and uh you you've been a big fan of uh, self-defense and martial arts i'm assuming from like a small childhood right from from a children's age yeah i didn't have a lot of exposure to it because my dad wouldn't let us do it like my brother and i was like let, we let us let's we want to take karate we let us take karate whatever why didn't he let you take it this is too violent you don't want you punching each other in the face or something i don't i don't know you know i don't know so it probably has something to do with i don't think he understands you know you know this in almost any martial art but you know usually people that people that have been taking some kind of martial art for any length of time like they don't start fights because number one you realize that you lose and win and you don't know who somebody is. So it's stupid. The other thing is, is the more confident you're, you are in your own ability, the less you need to prove it. So, you know, you typically, you know, they're not going around starting fights. You have to really piss somebody off, provoke them. Um, maybe my guess is that he thought maybe we would just want to fight, you know, but anyway, for whatever reason, I couldn't do it. So then finally as an adult and getting, you know, freed, having freedom from my first uh, relationship, um, I just started, 
decided to start doing things that I wanted to do. And that was really do. awesome. And you almost got into cage fighting uh, at one point. Can we talk a little bit about that? <laughs> well, it was very, yeah, I mean, I was going to... You, you know, you started to. You didn't, obviously, but... I was going to do a fight, yeah, and I got, got training me, injured me. And, uh, oh, I thought you injured yourself. I didn't realize he, he injured you. No, he did. Um, and so he felt bad about it. Um, and he was like, man, it's my, it's my job to, to, you know, get you better, stronger, get you ready. And I screwed it up, you know? Um, so I didn't do it. Um, I didn't do the fight. And then basically, so a little time passed. And I don't feel bad about it now, but I also had like an ethical thing going on. And like, so even when I took the fight, I was kind of in the middle of something like I didn't, you know, I was wondering whether, you know, sport fighting, yeah, you I know, the ethics of that. It just, it's not how you wanted to represent yourself, which is I mean, so, there's nothing wrong with it. Uh, but I don't have saying. any problem with it now, but I was in a process. And, you know, when you're not fixed on something, we don't understand it fully, you know, also that's you know, it's hard to be committed. And I was kind of pulled into it. So it's not something, but I actually, um, I actually might want to do. Oh, really? If, yeah. You're thinking about it? Yeah. If like, if I had the time and stuff like yeah. that, I mean, it'd be very much amateur hour because, you know. Well, as your business picks up with the PI stuff and it becomes real big and you can hire the people to, to do stuff, dude. Right. Well, if yeah, if that happens, I'll be your towel boy, your water boy. <laughs> so, but yeah, I mean, your if I had, to, I need some time to train, you know. Um, but you know, like if you're gonna, if you want to do it professionally, you got to be training two times a day. Sure. Yeah. You know, six multiple. days a week. Yeah. So you know, but the thing is, they do have, you know, they, you know, these amateur fights and guys are in positions like you, working jobs and stuff like that. And they're training when they can and, you know, whatever. And I think they usually try to match you up with someone that's had a similar history. So if you've never had a fight, someone that's, you know, had two fights or less, um, if possible, a newbie, you, you, you know, zero, zero win loss column for both of you. Um, but just for the record, I mean, man? yes, the fights I got into growing up were, you know, due to bullies picking them. So you do the math. How many people pick on people that are their size or smaller than they are? Um, I mean, that's the classic bully tale right there, dude. Okay, so I didn't lose any of those. Um, and, you know, I routinely um, have to work with people that are larger than I am and grapple with them and stuff like that. Now, do I win every time? No. Um, and does size matter? Yes, it does. Um, but I've had success against a lot of larger people. So I don't count myself out, but I assume nothing. Like, I treat everyone like, you know, they could kick my ass. And But, you know, I'm not looking for a fight. But the difference, you know, in talking about, like, my desire to possibly do a fight, like, it's a bucket list thing. But, okay, I see. But my desire to do that now is for me. Before, like, people, other people were trying to get me to do it. And so it wasn't really for me so much. Because the, the jujitsu instructor was saying, like, you were so athletic and you were really good that you should get, because he did it and he wanted you to do it. And you were, he was your buddy. And so, yeah, I, I see. I see how that works. And he was very, yeah, he was very talented. Um, yeah, he was I very know. talented. Yeah, yeah. I've, saw, I've seen some of his stuff. And, um, so, yeah, he was getting me to do it. And, you know, there's some camaraderie there. And I, and I genuinely like the guy, you know, and um, I enjoyed being with him. And I enjoyed training with him. I enjoyed learning from him. I learned a little extra. Um, but, yeah, now it would be for me, like for my personal growth. And so motivation on that is a little higher. First things first, but if I, if I got the chance, you know, I think I'd like to do it. And also... Less fear you have of losing, you know, so what? So what if I lose? Yeah, because you want to do it regardless. I got you, man. Yeah, I mean, I hope you do. Like, I mean, if that's what you want to do, man, I feel like you'll do it. I'll Probably got to do it before I'm 50 I'll or something. I'll be right there with a the thumb finger <laughs> and a cheerleader outfit. <laughs> no, don't do that. No, I had, um, 
I was about to say I should probably do it before I'm 50, but then I thought about Herschel Walker did his MMA fights in like his He's in his 40s though, wasn't he? Maybe it was his late 40s. Oh, was it late 40s or I thought he was? Yeah, I think it was. He was almost 50, but that was incredible. And oh, he, I mean, he yeah. won them. He was, I mean, he's also like, was running back. So he's already super athletic and muscular. So if you, from what I've studied, you know, and I, obviously I'm not an expert at any of this stuff. I'm just saying it off the top of my head. But like, if you're already athletic, like you, you're a very good, it's a good proponent for you to get into that. If you're athletic, like you're. Yeah, that, that's true. A athleticism helps, but, um, you know, technique. Like as, once you learn the technique, like I've dealt with people with Krav Maga that, um, that are not very athletic at all, or they're older and they lost athleticism. But once they learn the mechanics, all they got to do is get the technique and then they start getting smooth. So you can overcome a lot of that. Yeah. I've also found too, that in martial arts stuff that it, it's also not necessarily just how big your muscles are and stuff like that, but how good your cardiovascular system is. Like, how much do you have in the gas tank? It's that position and leverage. Right. But, you know, that's the big thing about Brazilian jiu-jitsu as opposed to, excuse me, traditional Japanese jiu-jitsu. You know, they, they learned how to use leverage and make it less of a strength match. But a lot of it has to do with angle, leverage, you know, um, using the other person's force and momentum against them. Because you don't have to be strong if you use their energy. But yes, I totally agree, Matt. <laughs> I just, I'm going to say this. You shouldn't cut this out, Matt, because it's funny. But there, if, there's, if anybody notices the little clip here, it's because we took a pee break. Yeah. So you cut it out. Bronis. Cheers, brother. L'chaim. L'chaim. Tell people what that means for people that don't know what it means. I know what it means. To life. Yeah. It's a way to say cheers in Hebrew. Well, and you know, Spanish cultures will say salud, which means like to your health well-being it's the same i mean it's the same concept right l'chaim to life to your to your well-being to your livelihood to your life uh salute to your health i mean it's a similar concept shalom is that similar as well that has to do with peace but to um, peace so that because I've, I've seen people cheer do cheers with that or toast rather shalom is a typical you know greeting um to say hi it whatever. is hebrew though right yeah Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So like, um, when you, in Hebrew, when you ask somebody how they're doing, you don't say, how are you doing? You ask, it literally means, how is your peace? And Shalom doesn't have That's to, cool. yeah, it doesn't have to do with like external circumstances. So much. it means like your personal peace, like inside. So yeah. When you ask someone how they're doing, you say, how's your peace? I got a Jewish friend. <laughs> well, I'm not Jewish. Yeah, no, I'm just kidding. I, I do go to the synagogue. He does go to the synagogue. Uh, Gabriel and Sarah. Um, fantastic people. Yeah, thanks um, again for um, linking us together, by the way. That was great. And also, at some point soon, Gabriel, I'm going to get you on the show. I haven't forgotten about you. Just got to read your book. <laughs> I don't have to read your book, but I want to before you're on the show. That's my personal thing. Yeah, he, he makes men everywhere look bad, though. What do you mean? Because, um, you know, I don't Because want... he's super romantic. Sarah was just, she was bl like on the whole show, she was blushing about all the wonderful romantic yeah, things yeah, he does for her. It's pathetic. <laughs> so, the, yeah, I told him the other day I hated him because he's making me look bad. Sarah said, maybe you just got to work a little harder. And oh, I said, yikes. I said, well, you're busting you're, your balls, bro. Yeah, you're probably right. Um, but uh, yeah. That's good, though. Maybe you need to hear it. <laughs> I try, but really, it's hard to uh, it's it's hard to outdo that guy in that department. So I just I just want him to keep his you know stuff to himself. Gabriel, so if that you it does right now. You better listen. This guy will destroy you. <laughs> no, so that it doesn't get out. I'm kidding. No, I, if I did anything to Gabriel, he's he's a doctor. He just patch himself up. He's a doctor. He's. He's one of the best guys I know. Um, super loyal. What about this guy? I said one. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm busting balls, bro. No, super loyal. It does nothing but encourage people. I yeah. mean, I would be afraid 
you know, that God would come after me if I. Uh, going back though to the about how he's so romantic, can, can I ask? And it's a little more personal, but do you do a lot of romantic things for Evelyn? I know she's probably going to listen to this or watch it. This um, one's for you. This proves for you, Evelyn. Evelyn is probably laughing right now. <laughs> so I totally blew our proposal. Um, your marriage proposal? Oh yeah, let's hear it. But Evelyn's such a good woman, you know. Um, you know, I'm just thinking, so I couldn't afford a ring. And so I used one of Evelyn's grandmother's or great grandmother's rings as an engagement ring. People do that. Um, It's a thing. Yeah. I felt pretty bad about it. Um, also, um, Evelyn got me out of debt and, uh, when we got married, I had a car payment, and she's like, let's just knock all that out. Yeah. Yowzas. That money did not come from what I brought into the She's house. a strong, independent woman. Look at her. She's just sacrificial, you know, but the thing is, like, you know, how do you, how do you compete with that? How can I be, you know, disloyal to her? You know, she just, she gives everything, you know, to people she cares about, but romantically i'm i'm not i'm not like you i'm not, not like, like gabriel <laughs> i mean i have my thing like um so when we pro- when i proposed she already knew what she was getting she already i can't, i couldn't surprise her so i had the uh, this was when i was going to the other martial arts school right right premiere, premiere and i was martial. and i was about to go there for class and i had my uniform on and so i was like well um, it went something like this. Since you already know what you're getting, you know, whatever. Um, I'm sorry, I shouldn't be laughing. How about we just, you know, like make it official. So, and just do it right now. So, you know, we marry me, whatever. I didn't get on a knee. I was standing up, you know. Um, didn't do any of those stereotypical things. Didn't have nice clothes on. Didn't take her anywhere. Didn't do anything. And of course she said yes, but you know, it was very anticlimactic. And she said, you know, I was just, I don't know, just hoping that, you know, one day we would go to the park or, you know, picnic lunch or something like that. And then, you know, or dinner or under the stars, you know, I do something romantic and I'm just in my, uh, you know, probably, uh, you know, probably the sweat smell couldn't get out of those clothes no matter what detergent you use. And I'm in my, martial arts stuff and I'm like well you just want to do it you just want to make it official (laughs) so it was horrible um but she did say yes I've gotten a little better but in my mind it's like what can I do like she knows what's going to happen if I take her somewhere soon she knows what's going to happen because Evelyn and I talked about everything because we got engaged after six weeks but we talked about everything in those six weeks like what are your thoughts on this what do you think? How many kids do you want? How do you want to raise them? You know, what do you think about this? And we aired all our dirty laundry out, everything. So there was like nothing I could surprise her with. So that was my thought. But I understood that maybe the formality of it meant something after the fact. <laughs> but I'd already, I'd already blown that. Um, now, I have been successful in reading her on anniversaries birthdays and finding good gifts and like picking them out myself not asking her not doing anything but trying to pick up clues and i've been very successful with that so i like to feel like possibly i've made up a little bit but i am look man i i'm kind of straightforward i'm a little crude <laughs> you are but it's it's but that's um, what makes you lovable i feel like uh I am not, yeah, I'm not the romantic guy, you know, whatever. I, I feel like, but she knew this about you and like she, she just, you know, she's in love with you and who you are, right? You're a good looking guy. You're also super tough. So like the conversation she's having with her girlfriends in the beginning, it's like, oh yeah, my boyfriend, Tommy, he's so cute and he got me roses and all this stuff. And then my boyfriend, Bobby, he took me to the movies and, and read me poetry. And then she's like, yeah, well, my boyfriend matt could beat up your boyfriends i don't i don't know now i will say i do write her poems like oh that's good 
That's in, awesome. That's in, romantic. In fact, in instead of giving cards because the shit they have out there nowadays, like I can't find anything that's suitable. Poems are so much more meaningful, though. I mean, I feel like it's a the favorite pastime of typical romance. A guy writes a poem to the chick. I mean, it's so I, you know, I got tired of the cards, and admittedly, sometimes it's because I didn't have enough time. So I just like wrote a poem, like five minutes, and then or you know, ten, fifteen, whatever, and then. Put it out there. But I mean, I put enough thought into it, but with the time I had, but, um, but I, I've, I've done stuff like that, you know, but I'm just not like, and it's hard for me to be that I'm not, I'm not smooth. I'm not syrupy sweet. I'm not, um, you know, so she doesn't get all either, you know, when, when the girls are talking about how sweet their guy's been or whatever, it's like, you know, cause I'm. And I don't mean any harm by it, but like I'll just walk into something. And I'll be like, "Why is this over here? Why is this? What's going on here?" And and I'm not trying to be rude, but I just you know sometimes after the fact, I'm like, you know, that can come off a little, and maybe like I'm almost blaming her, accusing her, you know, not doing something right or something. But I don't know. I'm just, I don't know. I'm not. I'm not very refined. I'm more. Cavemanish, I guess. Yeah, I mean, you're crazy. That's why. That's why I'm friends with you. I love. I love. I'm going to tell you this right also, now. Also, I have mental illness, so that you know. Right. Well, so yeah, there's that. Um, when I uh, back when we worked together and stuff like, that, and even a little after that, people used to be like, "My man, that Matt Holder guy, he's crazy." <laughs> For people that didn't know you, if people actually got to know you, like they wouldn't say that. But these are like a few people, and I'm like, "Crazy, why do you, why do you say that?" Because he's intense. Why not? He's a passionate guy. I'm passionate. So I guess I'm crazy too. But that's why we're friends, man. I love outliers. Yeah. I'll take it as an insult. It's a great thing, man. You've accomplished a lot in your life. So. Yeah, I mean, I'm working on I it. I feel like, here's the thing. You got to be crazy to really make an impact on this life. If you're just vanilla and standard and ordinary, nobody's going to remember your name. You're not going to make the impact. You're just, you're just a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy. What the narrator said in Fight Club. Like, oh, it's a copy of a copy of a copy. You gotta be you gotta be, you know, crazy. You gotta be wild to to live your dreams and make an impact and to change people's lives. If that's what you want to do. So Well, um, I mean, I think, know. yeah, everybody's life's about that, but I don't give a shit about my name anymore. Um you know, my main thing is yeah, I mean, I want to make an impact. Whether if I know I'm making impact, that's enough. Like, I don't, I don't have to, like, I don't, I don't need the credit for it too much anymore. Like if I, if I can see the results of things that I'm doing, like with my kids teaching them and it, you know, this is another thing, like my parents, her parents, everyone else, but my kids love the Punisher. They're six, four and two. They love the freaking Punisher. Um, they've seen most, if not all of the episodes the Netflix episodes, by the way, that's what everyone's little crush oh really uh, yeah well you know so so at first she wasn't gonna watch it with me because it was so she's like oh that guy's cute so so violent <laughs> well no that wasn't her first thing it was it was his demeanor because the punisher you know he he doesn't just go kill random people he kills people to protect other people or like to avenge his family stuff like that um but you know he's a protector and he'll give his life for anybody like, and he can't stand by. Like, the second season's about that. He could not stand by while that girl was in trouble. So I think she she saw that once she knew that it wasn't just this violent, you know, um, Avenger, kill all the bad guys, um, unfeeling guy. But, you know, you see the... Bernthal does a good job because you see the struggles um, that a man like that would go through, you know, internally. Like, he externally, you know, displays that. And you can empathize with him, like if you put yourself in that position. But you see the struggle he goes with, like in the first season where he's like smash, he's working the construction, smashing through the walls, and he sometimes he can't sleep, so he has to get up and go out there and just smash the walls. He's having nightmares all the time. He's beat himself on the in the ribs and chest, you know, whatever. Um, you see that, and if you're a father, you would understand that. Like if you thought about the loss of your kid, even if you think about it, you can empathize. Um, you certainly can't understand it the way someone that's lost a child has, but even thinking there, you know, even going that road in your mind, 
um, is enough to make a father empathize. Yeah, so stuff like that. My kids have seen all the Rambos. Well, my six and four year old. Nice. And Even the newest one that came out, like, was it? Twice. Seen it twice. Oh, wow. So that was her first movie in the theaters. And Miriam was four and Oziel was two. So when we went to see that movie. And the two year old sat quiet? No, he he was a little restless. You know, we had to tell him, hey, you're going to have to calm down. Oh, you're one around. of those people, man, that brings the, the screaming kids to the theaters. No, 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 like, oh, not screaming. We just had to, we just had to, you know, reinforce he needed to sit still. He couldn't just move around like he wanted to, get to distract people, all that kind of stuff. But it wasn't very full. Um, but, you know, I show them those things for a reason. So, you know, Miriam is six, but she can articulate when it would be justified to use violence or kill and when it would not. And Miriam's the sweetest kid, most obedient kid. But my parents were in my in-laws and my coworkers. Everyone was like, I, you know, are you sure you should be doing that? You know, whatever. But we have ethical discussions during it. And Miriam, she's always been inquisitive. She's like, why is he doing that? Is that good? Is that a bad guy? Is that a good person? Why is he killing him? You know, why is this happening? Um, and so she asks all these questions and I explain things to her. Um, and Miriam is not even close to being violent by nature. Um, so I do teach her a little bit of stuff. So she gets Oziel in the rear naked joke. Um, if he won't leave her alone. Nice. <laughs> but well, maybe nice. I don't know. If you're not home to supervise, it might not be so nice. Well, but the thing is like Miriam's so trustworthy and this is, this is serious. Um, so what I, I've instructed, I said, look, you get him in this chokehold because I wanted to pra- practice a proper choke. Um, but I said, you are not allowed to squeeze and you're not allowed to suck in, you know, breathe in air, expand your chest. Because I said, if you do that, he could pass out. So she is obedient enough that she will not do it. She just gets him in there, holds him tightly enough where he can't move until he says, I will stop, I will stop. And then she lets He's him go. He's like aggravating her and stuff. And she lets him go and that's it. I feel like anybody, any uh, girl that has like a annoying younger brother, they should listen to us. Just learn how to do a proper rear naked show. <laughs> yeah. There you go. You're good to go. Well, you know, one of my things is like, um, and I don't think you can ever go around saying it'll never happen to me, but little kids, remember that three-year-old down in Avondale got kidnapped and killed by that, those two people involved in child porn or whatever. Um, how do I know? How do I know that's never going to happen? You know, and Miriam's, the kids when they're little, they lack the coordination, the strength, you know, to overcome that stuff. So you, the only way they're going to survive is if you, if you teach them how to be brutal. So, you know, Miriam, you know, the kids will go around saying like a bad person comes in, you know, I, I might be able to take this frying pan and hit him with it, you know, whatever. But we talk about, you know, ripping eyeballs out of the sound of that. <laughs> Um, I shouldn't laugh. I know it's part of the Krav Maga stuff too. Well, you know, I, I said you, I said, if some, if you get a hold of you, if you can bite them, I said, you bite, but you take, you're going to take some human tissue with you. You do not bite and just leave a mark. You take something with you. Um, I've talked to her about, cause we have, they have a book, you know, some books out there for kids, you know, that teach them that you don't have to accept somebody like touching you inappropriately, whatever. Cause people do that. Um, and so, you know, book about private parts and you got a right to protect yourself, you know, that kind of thing. And, you know, I've told her that if anybody does anything like that, I said, if you have to, I said, you bite it, you know, bite it off. Um, so you take the eyes out, you rip them all the way out, whatever. If you can get a pencil, jab it in their eye, do whatever, you know, you do whatever you can. To get out of there, because that's the only way, like, that's the only way they can survive. They have to, they have to do that. They're not going to be able to submit some dude and control him and punch him out, you know, kick him, whatever. Um, now, you know, I teach him to go for the, you know, vulnerable areas, which means I've taken a lot of kicks to the crotch. From my <laughs> I'm, I'm sure. And she's getting pretty good at it. Um, I like so. that's what we were doing a lot when I was training with you in the Krav Maga, is just taking shots to the nuts all the time. Well, yeah, I, I, fell so, in, I fell in love with my cup, my yeah. cod piece. I was in love with it. Well, it I mean, saved yeah, me so many times. Yeah, difference between self defense and sport fighting, right? 
but you know, I do that. I do that because of not because I'm, you know, out here trying to, um, you know, be something controversial, but like I've thought about it, like something like that happens, what are they going to need to know? And if I just hold off because mom and dad or in-laws or coworkers or other people, you know, they're saying, oh, that's, you know, it's just too much for this, it's too much for this, but something happens to them, then I'm going to feel at fault. I can't live with myself. So it's not like my kids walk around just, you know, talking about. Yeah, I think, I think what's important is that is if, the, if this is, you're teaching them how to defend themselves, even in the most violent ways like that, as long as they understand, like, what the violence is and they understand, like, the difference between right and wrong and good and, and just and all that stuff, as long as they understand that and you're educating them, I mean, it should be fine, right? Now, if, it was, if it was just that stuff outright, and there's no education behind it, then yeah, it might be kind of bad news for them growing up. But I agree totally. So that's my thing. So like my kids, if they if they use violence inappropriately, you know, excuse me, to take advantage of some person or without justification, you know, something's not they're no threat to them or excuse me, they don't have to defend themselves. Then they get in trouble. So I mean, the context is reinforced, you know, by the discipline. But the thing is, I, it's hard to, it's, it's harder work to sit there and try to, you know, enable your children to understand that, especially at a younger age. And the thing is, like, one thing I got a lot was, oh, they're too young to understand this or that. And, and that's not just with this, but, like, I would explain why I discipline. Like, even, but my theory is, even though they don't, they can't understand everything I'm saying, they're going to get a little bit. And I could wait three or four years and say, okay, now they're at a level they can understand and we can start from scratch or they can gradually understand bits and pieces and they can come to a fuller understanding faster. And I feel like that's what I've seen, you know, with my kids. Um, and so, you know, as a parent, you're, there's you kind of testing, experimenting, you know, um, but that was kind of my theory, but I feel like it's been working because my kids have articulated things in their own words to me, showing me that they understood what I was saying. So when you're, when they're able to put it in their own words, you know, they kind of understand it. If they're just, you know, repeating what you said, that's a whole different thing. I, I don't have, I'm, I get, I get it. And for other people that are, that don't get it, well, study a little bit more. I get it. I totally get it, man. Makes a lot of sense. And I'm not saying everybody has to do everything like I do. It, of course not. Yeah, yeah, you you are an individual. This is how you're raising your your you and your wife are raising your kids, and it's they're fine, they're healthy and happy, and they're learning they're learning something. They're learning something very valuable that could potentially save their life. And I had a guy on um, last week uh, who who did amateur boxing. We were talking about self defense and stuff like that, and he talked about how he didn't he got out of it, but he still knew it. And I asked him if he ever used his boxing cause he's in real life situation. And he said, no. And I was like, well, better to have it and not need it than need it, not have it. And so I feel like that's probably basically the basis for what you're talking about, man. Let me ask you this, dude. Uh, this is uh, the more personal part of, I mean, all of this has been pretty personal, but what are you, Matthew Holder? What are you wrestling with, brother? <laughs> well, it's all... Ask. It's always, even, even though I don't need medication anymore, it's still a daily struggle. It, you know, perfectionism. You needed medication for that? Obsessing. Yeah. I oh, mean, for, you're talking about for your OCD? Yeah. Why don't you need medication anymore? So with OCD, you know, you have, um, I think the frontal lobe here. So it just cycles thoughts like there's a glitch. You can rewire your brain, though, through behavioral it's like anything else. Like when you're when you learn a new skill, you teach you're teaching your brain, your body, new neural pathways. So with OCD, it's just cycling thoughts, and you have intrusive thoughts, and you don't want those thoughts, but they're they're just bombarding you constantly. Um, so you know, I was I was manipulated a lot. I was also struggling trying to find my own way and trying to overcome my own, you know sins, enslavement, um, you know, 
whether it's you know an enslavement to a particular sin, a a bad um, a bad habit, um, you know, unproductive behavior that I couldn't stop, or whether it was feeling the need to please other people. But yeah, I don't. As far as compulsive behavior, occasionally I fall into it with training or exercise, and I'll just uh, I'll wear myself out. I've seen it. Maybe, <laughs> I've trained with you. I've seen it. Yeah, um, but I've realized that's not really productive. It doesn't further your skills. Um, you know, I don't I don't do that so much. I'm able to lay off it, but I, you know, I still struggle with it. I still have thoughts, you know, intrusive thoughts um, that I want to have. Um, and I still struggle with like, I have to make myself stop, you know, I have to take command over myself and say, you know, and you know, the, the other, the other thing like is, you know, I torture myself before, like I used to wash, I used to wash my hands so much that my skin was cracking open, bleeding. I used to wash my throat with soap. Um, I took up to hour and a half long showers. Um, cause I just kept feeling like if I touched the wrong thing, like on the shower wall or whatever, I had to wash again. You sound like some of these people now with the COVID. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, one thing. Not to deviate the topic. No, no, no. But interestingly enough, like I, I, I talked about that with another friend of mine. I said, you know, someone who suffered through OCD and gone to, I said, some of the reactions remind me of symptoms of obsessive compulsive. Right, which isn't healthy. For people listening. No. Yeah, I mean, you, you got to be realistic. I mean, I'm not saying you don't take precautions, but sure. some of the panic has been, you know, it, it's it, it's gone too far. Right. But back to you. Yeah. So, so that's, that's just always a constant, that's a constant struggle. I feel like um, I can slip back into it. I'm, I'm miles from where I was, but I'm, you know, like for instance, when I worked at Sam's Club and I was in the fax and pool, click and pull thing. Okay, so I question myself so much that, you know, because you, you also don't have a sense of um, certainty about things with OCD. So I would, like, I would be pulling sodas. And let's just say, for example, I had Coke and Sunkissed or whatever, you know, red and orange, same family, they're close. I would be in a hurry or something, and I would pull it and, I would think, okay, I was supposed to get eight Cokes and four sink is whatever. And I was thinking, man, red and oranges, they're pretty close together. How do I know that I pulled the right amount of Coke and the right amount of Sunkissed? I better check it again. And I'd check it and I was like, oh, but I'm losing time. I need to, I need to move forward. I was, then I would think, you know, I checked that real fast. How can I be sure? How can I be sure that my check was correct? And then I only checked it once. I checked it. You know, I need to check it again. And man, I don't know. I mean, seriously, I might have checked something like that 10 times before I could move on. And then I would do that with the next product and the next. So it put you behind when you were trying to get those orders done. Yeah. And so I worked through that a little bit. But in the beginning, I was I was convinced that my uh, coworker was trying to get me fired. <laughs> um, oh, no. Judy, but, Judy, Judy, Judy. Shh. It, I didn't want to bring that in Sam's is so also like, for instance, you know, sometimes in Sam's club, when you're stocking or doing something, there'd be like some hair on there. And I would be like, man, that hair's a little curly. I don't think that came from a head. <laughs> and if I touched it, I would run to the bathroom and I would wash my, ar- whatever it was, I'd wash my arms. I, I would wash my legs Jesus in the bathroom at Sam's Christ. club. And then I would have to get paper towels and wipe up the water on the ground. Oh man, that's wild, dude. Yeah. I I mean, I checked things over and over. I remember one time I left my house and, uh, well, my parents house the time I was living with them. And so if I drove over something with a car and I didn't see it, like, I'd be like, what was that? What if it was a dog or a baby? (laughs) (laughs) Now, why, why a baby would be out in the street alone? I don't know. You know, maybe I missed the mom. But, you know, I'd think, and then I'd drive, and one time I told myself, I said, it's all in your head, stop, you just got to go. And I was going to work. I got down, pulled out of the neighborhood onto Highway 150, and 
when I got past the Toyota dealership, I had to turn around and come back. And I was like, I just couldn't take it anymore. I had to make sure. It was just a stick. But those little subtlety, like, you know, you could drive over something like that. You can tell it's not a human being. It's a little stick. But those little subtleties, like, you lose. You're so tense and anxious and you're so wrapped up in your head. Like, you, you can't make those subtle distinctions. Um, but yeah, I mean that, um, and I, and for a long time I couldn't, like I would come to a conclusion, think I'd come to a conclusion about something. And I was like, you know, how can I be sure? And I just have to go through right back to the beginning and think through it all again, all again, all again. And I just, you know, I'd lie there for hours, um, doing stuff like that. If somebody said something to me, I remember one time, um, when I was a kid and this person said, I think I was probably standing there and maybe my wrist was slightly bent or something you know, like that means you're homosexual. <laughs> and so I was like, just to, just to give you an idea of what somebody with OCD would think, like most people would say, never had a thought like that in my life. Shut up, big <laughs> you know, whatever. But I was like, does it, does that mean that? What if I am? I've never thought about it. How do I know I'm not? What if he's right? And then so like... If that's the case, I feel like I have borderline OCD. Not clinical. But you know what I'm saying? Like, sure. It was I, like I never had a thought about that. I never desired anything like that. But I was like, if he's right, what if somewhere... How do I know? What if it comes out? I don't know. You know, so like just stuff like that. But, um, you know, now I know myself a little better. So I can just, you know, blow stuff off, you know. But I still, I still struggle with the perfectionism, which I think um, comes from this feeling, you know, a lot of times of, you know, maybe inadequacy. Um, and, you know, maybe sometimes it's, sometimes it's, you know, people please or measuring up. But yeah, man, it's just, uh, I used to be in a place and, you know, with the disorder, you're, um, basically it's defined by it, 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 you know, your compulsive behaviors take, um, they significantly, um, inhibit your ability to, you know, perform daily activity. But I mean, I was having a problem, you know, getting things done and I was like a prisoner in my own, in my own head. Um, and so I wasn't able to function outside. Um, outside of myself so it was um, but it was interesting but you know I feel like I've you know um, through God I've kind of been able to reemerge like it's almost like I feel like you know I'm here I've got this body but it's almost like I feel like at one point in time like I just shrunk in and sank back so much like I couldn't come out, like who I was could not come out and express itself and could not utilize my body to express and be who I was created to be in this world. And I was some, somewhere hidden like deep down inside, but I was unknowable from the outside. And I, I didn't even know myself, like I was, you know, hiding from myself. And then, um, but, you know, the more I've known about God and the, and the more I've come in line with his will and the healthier I've become, um, the more I feel like I'm emerging again, if that makes sense, like a flower in bloom or something. You don't know how beautiful the flower, like if it was the first flower and you didn't see the plant, you know, but it's the first bloom. Like if you didn't have prior experience, you wouldn't know how beautiful and full and, and full of life that flower could have. Um, it has to emerge. You know, and to me, it feels like that, like, you know, and I'm continuously emerging, like I'm not there yet. You know, I'm still, I still got a lot of work to do, um, but I do try to take on one thing I agree with, like Jocko Wilk and um, David Goggins is, is that I think you, you've got to challenge yourself and you can never be, fulfill your potential unless you take on a new challenge and you just keep. And I'm not saying like, you know, you got to take on appropriate level of challenge for you, but incrementally, 
you should always be moving on to the next challenge so that you can grow. Because otherwise you, you can't, you know, you just stagnate. You know, there's a plateau you reach. But is that what we're really meant to do? You know, or are we meant to become more? Did God create us and, and he created the seed of what we are? And then through the course of our entire lives, we're supposed to, you know, grow and bloom and become more fully who we are. But I, I think our whole life is a process of blooming and growth. And so that's the way I see it. But that also helps me in my day to day with the OCD because I'm not, even though I still battle with it, I'm not a slave to this feeling that I have to be perfect and everyone, everything has to be in line now. I realize it's a process. And, and then when you think that way, then you can see where you were and where you are and you can be happy. So, you know, at least I'm there. You know, I've got a lot of work to do. I got a lot of fears. I got a lot of weaknesses and shortcomings. But, you know, from where I was, you know, I'm, I can be happy with where I am at this moment, but I'm not happy if I'm still here at the same point, like six months or a year from now. So I always want to progress, but I can enjoy the progress too and not just look at everything I lack because that, that made me miserable. Very well said, sir. Very awesome. And also thank you very much for sharing all that, especially you talking about your, your mental health issues and stuff like that. I know that's a personal thing, but I appreciate you uh, putting that out there. Yeah. Well, for anybody that's dealing with that, it, it was, you know, there is a lot more to it than that. It's, I'm sure it gets a lot worse. So, I mean, but people with OCD have a big, they have a big struggle and it's not as well known as ADHD and bipolar and stuff like that. And, the, and they don't know the mental anguish that somebody with obsessive compulsive disorder can deal with. I think you're in a really good place though, man. And I'm, I'm very happy for you. I'm very proud of you. Not that I'm someone that could be proud of you, but I'm just happy of your success and, and where you're going. And I feel like you're, you got a good, um, good direction and you seem very happy and healthy. So that's really important. Thanks for being on the show, brother. I really, thanks for doing all this. Um, before I close it all up, I want to get you to, for anybody that's, that needs, uh, your services for PI stuff, or if they want to get into self-defense, how can they reach you? How can they find you? Uh, go ahead and plug in and let people know in the local area if they want to get your services. Okay. Yeah. I mean, the, the PI business is, is Dirty South Investigations, which I got, I got a website on that. And, and then, you know, it's, it's two times a week. It's part-time, but I, I teach the Krav Maga lessons 5.30 to 6.30 Mondays and Thursdays. Um, I'm in Innovation Depot right now. Um, small class, but we got a good group. Um, and the business is vindication. Probably if anybody uh, needs your services, is it okay if I give them your number to yeah, yeah. do Krav or they need a PI? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, for sure. Excellent. Thanks again, brother, for being on the show, yeah. man. It was awesome. I hope you Thanks. had fun. Yeah. I mean, I've never <laughs> done anything like this. It feels a little weird. You did good though, man. You got a good voice too. You got a really good voice for this kind of stuff. But thanks again. Ladies and gentlemen, this is another episode of The Wrestling Diaries, the podcast show for The Average Joe, where we find out about the struggle that is manhood and how we overcome our adversities through our faith and our beliefs and our friends and our environments and just ourselves. And that's really important. And my friend Matthew, my other friend Matt here, um, he's got a great story to tell and he's, he's got a lot of stuff going on in his life. So check him out if you need a private investigator for any kind of anything you got going on, or if you want to get healthier and fit or learn how to defend yourself, check out with his Krav Maga stuff. Thank you for tuning in. As always, check us out on YouTube for the video content, like, share, comment, subscribe, hit the notification bell for more content we release weekly. Also check us out on Spotify and Apple Podcasts and Google Podcasts to hear us on the audio. Thank you for tuning in for this episode. I hope you got something really awesome out of it. I know I did. And it's always a pleasure to hang out with my, my good friend, Matt, here. Tell me, what do you wrestle with and how can you beat it? One love.